Okay. The first thing is just say that you're sitting in a trade or you're looking to take a trade and you've got something like a two pip SL. So you, um, in the scenario where you have um, something like a two pip SL, you'll be hitting like one to 10, one to 20 really, really fast. You might hit um, a one to 10 before you even break the M1 or the M5 structure. So you're already floating 10% on your, you took a 1% risk, you're already floating 10% on your account. And the market's only moved 20 pips. So in terms of structure, you're not really safe to break even on that trade yet. So me, um, so a scenario of something like this, where you have like your trending market here, and then you had your BOS, you take your entry here, and now the market is currently floating around this region here. So what's happened in this scenario is you got um, a very tiny SL. Um, just imagine this is um, just going to put something like that. You got a two pip SL, you got even sub five pip SL. And now imagine this is taking place on like the M1 or the M5 time frame. You're floating one to 10, one to 15, significant amounts so that you'd be considering taking profit on that trade or at least breaking even on that trade because of how much you're floating in terms of your pound amount or your dollar amount in the position. How, we, how would I personally break even on that trade or how do we break even? Well, in a scenario like this, because we haven't broken structure yet. So this point is still um, available to be taken out because imagine this is the M1 and there's some POI still uh, left available here. Um, let, me, let me just put some drawings on. Just say because we have a point of interest here. So until, uh, and again, we're looking at M1 timeframe here. Until the market doesn't break through this low here, this point up here is still valid um, for the market to retrace up to. So anything like this could happen. At this point, it could just turn around here, come here, t uh, mitigate off this, and then create the lower low. So until uh, the M1 structure point has been taken out, these higher entries or higher uh, uh, IFCs or POIs, all of that is still valid. So when it comes to a position like that, and obviously um, you want to have the breathing room for your trade, um, you want to give the trade breathing room for in case anything like that does happen or in case it wants to come up to some points of interest very high up, very close to your um, entry price. In a scenario like this, what I would do is when I hit around 1 to 10 risk to reward, I tend to take off. I leave my SL exactly where it is. So my SL is still sitting at my initial entry. But what I tend to do is I tend to take partials of what my risk is. So just say in this position, I risk 10 pounds. And I'm floating one to 10, so I've got 100 pounds profit. I'll eliminate 10 pounds of the profit that I'm in. So I'll take off 10% of the volume that I'm in. So this allows my trade to still have that breathing room. And you'll see sometimes what happens, um, actually not even sometimes, a lot of times what happens, um, I think I got an example from this week as well. Uh, when we start breaking down the charts, I'll show you guys. Um, what happens is sometimes you'll get a strong initial reaction, and then the market will come back to your entry one, two, three times and break. Um, come back to your entry one, two, three times before it actually makes the drop. And in a scenario like this, if you broke even on your trade, what's going to happen is you're going to get taken out of the trade before the real move takes place. Um, because it's on the M1 time frame as well, um, you tend to see this quite a lot. It might be creating some form of liquidity to take out in the future. So if I'm personally sitting in a trade like this, I'll keep my SL exactly where it is, just in case um, the market does de decide to return to my entry price. But I'll make myself risk-free in terms of how much I risk or how much money I put into that position. So again, if my risk was ten pounds, when I'm like one to ten or anything around that. So when you have a two to five pip SL, it's only twenty to fifty pips in profit. I'll start taking partials off my risk. Obviously, if I'm starting to see um, some um, some what you call it, um, some signs that the market is looking to reverse, then I'll start to take more partials, but. As long as my bias, uh, I haven't seen anything for my bias to still be confirmed, I'll at least take my risk off the trade by removing, removing how much money I invested into that position. Um, do, you guys only, do you guys only remove 10% when it comes to the POIs because compared to say leaving it all if you're getting in on the highest or lowest POI? Uh, if I got in at the highest POI and I got no reason to think that, for example, uh, my trade is going to get violated, then I'll still take off the risk because you need to have a time, have a point where you break even on your position. Okay. So um, 
you obviously you don't want to have your SL running at all times without taking any partials. And especially even if you analyze the trade with one to 100 potential, there's no guarantee that the market's going to re reach your final target. You have to get into the habit of taking volume off as you're going throughout the trade. In a one to 100 position, me personally, if I'm very, very confident on that one to 100 trade, then the most volume I'll probably leave up on to the final, final target is probably 50% of my volume from my initial entry to my final, final target of one to 100. But as I'm going throughout, um, at one to, one to 10 is my first step where I start taking profit and start removing volume off. And then as I go throughout, um, depending on how the market is playing out, because we you want to adapt to the market as every single move is happening. So if you're seeing signs of reversal at one to 30, then maybe that's a sign that you should take um, a significant amount of profit at one to 30. If you're seeing signs of reversal at one to 50, maybe that's a sign to take significant amount of profit at one to 50. You don't want to have the risk where at one point you're floating one to one, just because you want to hit that one to 100 position, you're floating one to 30 on a trade. And you'll see this happens a lot. Um, so if you're t if in terms of analyzing on potential of how many trades can hit one to 100 in a week, you can probably find the opportunity on at least half the charts you analyze. This is going to be a one to 100. This is going to be a one to 100. And I'll show you an example on GBP Chef that actually happened to me, um, what you call it, this week as well on GBP CHF. You'll see, okay, this has a potential of being a one to 100, one to 200, whatever, but really it goes to one to 30, one to 40, and then it turns around. Now, you don't want to have the situation where you're floating 40% of your account at one point, and now you're back to break even. So you want, you want to trade as efficiently as possible as you can. Like there's a saying, a dripping, uh, a dripping tap will always fill the bucket. So even if it's securing partials at 1 to 10, 1 to 20, 1 to 30, that will keep your account ticking over on a day-to-day -day basis. So, yeah, when you're taking, um, when you have a very tight SL and you haven't come to a structure point, uh, a break of structure point where the entry that you had is still valid for the market to return to that entry, keep your SL uh, where it is and just take that partials to make it. So in case it does return there and if it does hit your SL, you're still break even. You risk 10 pounds on that trade, you secure 10 pounds. So if it does hit SL, you lose that 10 pounds that you secured. So your, your, in terms of equity in your account or the balance in your account, you're break even. Yeah, on your MyFX book or whatever, it'll be documented as a loss, but it's not really a loss. It's not about how you can flex that or I haven't hit that many stop loss. The main purpose is to keep your account growing. And again, in, in practice, when you see this, this happens a lot where the market before it breaks structure, it can come back to your entry price and bounce one, two, three times in your entry price. So take the partials of your risk. So at this point so far, everyone follow this point. Yeah, once there's a BOS, um, then you know that the market, sh market shouldn't come back to that point anymore. In terms of structure, in terms of um, market theory, the market after a break of structure, if there's a point of interest anywhere up here or wherever, the market shouldn't come back to this point of interest after the BOS has happened. So you can uh, start actually physically bring your SL to break even now. But until then, um, remove partials of how much you risked into that trade. Okay. Second thing, which is quite key, um, is removal joint tools. Uh, let me go to a different shop. Uh, I've got nothing. Not anyway, it's the same. Okay. Second scenario that I, got, I want you guys to think about is where. Let's see what's happening in the chat box. Would the BOS have to be um, on a five minute for it to be significant enough for it to be, even if it's on M1, um, even if it's on M1 BOS in terms of structure, um, the, if the market shouldn't, if it's a point where the market shouldn't return to, then yeah. Obviously, if my M1 is the only time frame that's bearish and everything else is in bullish and I've got to sell on, then uh, potentially not. Uh, I'll wait for something more significant, but as long as what do you call it, um, there's no POIs and it is a proper BOA. It's not just like a market wicked below the previous low where I had a full body candle close below the previous low. Yeah, I'll physically break even on that trade. The second thing is where we have, um, let me draw the scenario out again, a scenario like this, where again, um, I'll just do our cells, where I've got my um, 
trend reversal or whatever, I got my BOS take place. And now I got a point of interest up here. But now I'm in a confusing situation because let's say I got two POIs or what do you call it? Um, two potential points that the market could um, reverse from. Now it could be something like you got an imbalance and above that imbalance, you got a proper IFC. The market could fill in the imbalance and react um, when it fills in the imbalances, touch the wick of your IFC, or it might want to come into the body of your IFC, so you're confused. Now, in this scenario, where the market is very close to each other, where my two POIs are like within five pips of each other, or 10 pips of each other, I'll, I'll, put, I'll personally start taking two trades. So, to say um, this was one POI, and this was basically an imbalance in the market, and then this is where my IFC mitigation was going to take place, okay? So these are the two potential points that the market could come and tap into. And literally it could be something like this where it comes over, taps into this and drops, or it could be, it just reacts here and it drops. Now, obviously the, there's two ways, there's th actually there's three ways you can approach this. Number one is you set a limit here and you set a limit here um, and basically have points of invalidation for each point of interest. So here you come in and you have your basically SL placed here and another limit here and you have your SL placed there. Now in this scenario, you have to consider what happens if my bias is wrong. Well, if you had a 1% risk in here and a 1% risk in here and the market does decide to violate, you took a 2% risk on a trade where you shouldn't have even taken. Um, a uh, Wally, Wally, for a second. Uh, repeat because I think the volume dropped like for, for like 10, 15 seconds. Okay. So I was saying um, in a scenario where you have um, something like this and you've got your point of interest here, but within your point of interest, you've got two potential entry zones. Maybe uh, you've got a scenario where there's an imbalance and on top of the imbalance, you've got IFC. So the market can easily come and react off your imbalance or it can come and react off your IFC. They're so close to each other, you're not really sure what to do. Um, in this personal scenario, in this scenario, when it comes to me personally, I'll start taking two trades. I look to take a trade here, something like this, and I have my SL above um, covering both my points of interest. And then I have my second um, points of interest, um, second trade fit like this. Where, yeah. So I'll call this basically my risk averse entry and my ag aggressive entry. Now, the way I'll split my risk is you see the entry that has the what do you call it, um, lower risk to reward or the entry with the biggest stop that's covering my two POIs. I tend to put 25% of my risk. So in a scenario where I was looking 1% of my account, is that just say I got a 10,000 pound account and I'm looking to in invest 1% into this bias, then 1% uh, into that bias is 100 pounds. I'll put 25 pounds as a risk into here and then I'll put 75 pounds as a risk into here, okay? And this play here, it tends to work better when, what do you call it? Um, when you look at your account holistically on how the market does tend to play out uh, in certain areas like this, because it can come mitigate here, not give a BOS, come back up, mitigate your higher point, and then drop. That's fully possible in the market. It might come and start generating liquidity at your first point. You get a reaction, it generates liquidity. It doesn't give you a BOS for you to start breaking this trade even. It generates um, liquidity, it gives you an FU candle here into your second POI and drops like that. But in a scenario where you risk, where you just say you had a um, hundred pound to risk and just say the trade is a one to 20 as an example. Now, if the one to 20 played, trade played out and you had a, what do you call it, um, hundred pounds to risk, then your overall profit would be at the end of that trade, 2000 pounds, right? 2000 pounds. Okay, but in a scenario like this, where this happens, where now you got one entry that's a one to 20 and you got one entry that's a, now because of the increased SL on it, that entry is now just say one to 10. Well, still, because you risk 25 pounds into this trade, you'll get your one to 10, sorry, um, you'll get, um, what's the word for it? You'll get a one to 10. So 25 times 10, you'll get 250 pounds out of it. And this place here where you risk 75% um, of your risk, 75% uh, of your overall risk, which was um, 75 pounds, if that plays to one to 20, um, which you marked out, then you'll gain one and a half thousand pounds. So overall, you'll get you'll gain one thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds. But once you'll gain about around eighty percent of what you were gauging to gain. Uh, both entry will have the yes. Both entry will have the exact same SL. First is twenty five percent, and second is seventy five percent. Yeah. Okay. 
and both entries will have the exact same SO. But in this scenario, when you play when you play the market like this, where scenarios like this take place, you end up walking away with 80% of what you were going to make anyway. Um, instead of taking and also without doubling up your risk, because um, you have to always uh, keep in mind what if I'm wrong. Uh, it's very easy to get confident in the market saying, yeah, one of them is going to play, but that's not, that's not always what happens. You need to, uh, again, if you're risking your hard earned money, you're investing your hard earned money into a position, you need to be a hundred, um, you need to be as risk averse as you can, because if you didn't split your risk like this, you took 1% here, 1% here, and the account goes the opposite, the trade goes the opposite way, then you took the overall 2% L on the trade. But in, the, in a case like this, where you, um, um, what's it called? where you split your risk between the two positions at 75, 25. If the trade fails, you only risk the 1% that you hoped for. Okay, so you, you haven't doubled your risk. Your risk is still the same. And if the trade does play out, then you gained 80% of what you were hoping to gain. Okay, and now you can come across, um, there's so many ways people, uh, when it comes to having two points of interest or three points of interest, as many points of interest as there is possible, there's so many ways that, so many things that go through people's mind. Sometimes, um, people will be like, um, and these are all valid scenarios that people have. They might be like, okay, I'm not going to take this entry. I'm only going to wait for this one. And then when the market comes to this zone, it, all, it plays out like this. It only tags this one in and you get nothing out of here. In this scenario, you still, at least you still made 25% of what you're going to, what would have been potentially a missed trade. So you still managed to make profit off something that could have potentially been a missed trade. Um, everyone following? Calculate loss says, yeah, the Stinu app that Kareem mentioned, yeah. Um, Stinu, I personally use as well. Um, I think it's the best app in terms of um, working out risk management. Um, and it's the fastest as well. Everything else kind of takes some um, quite a lot of time. But Stinu is just quick time on your phone, especially. And you need to be efficient as well. You need it to be fast because Stinu, spelled like this, S-T-I. Uh, so there, yeah. Stinu. Yeah, because especially if you're monitoring on the one minute time frame, you need it to be quick. You can't be, um, and you can't be filling in so many parameters because my FX book um, calculator, it wants you to fit in quite a lot of parameters. Uh, how many pips is your SL? What's the current market price right now? Stinu doesn't bother about anything like that. You just put in how many pips is your SL, which this box should tell you 5.3 pips. Okay, what currency pay are you trading? And that's it. What's your account balance? How much percent you want to risk? And also your account balance and your percentage risk, you can fix it on the app so you never need to fill it in again. You just put in what you call um, how many pips is your SL on the currency pair, boom, you have the exact lot size. And the good thing about Stinu is as well, um, you have a 5.3 pip SL, now you need to factor in your spread. Well, Stinu will give you the lot size for every single um, what you call a pip you can risk. So five, it'll give you the lot size for a five pip risk, six pip risk, seven pip risk. So you have all that information in front of you. So just say, um, I don't know, you're waiting in a scenario where you're waiting to market execute and the market's come into your point of interest. And by the time it's coming to your point of interest, the spread has increased to like one and a half pips. Well, it, the information is already displayed there. You don't need to recalculate the information. It's just there. You just type in the new lot size. Stinu has gold, yeah. Stinu doesn't show gold, etc. Yes, yeah, Stinu does have gold. Uh, Stinu does have gold. Okay, so that was um, so this was point number two. I'll type it all down as well, so you guys can grab a screenshot. Um, but that was point number two. Point number three. Um, one thing that actually this is quite important is twin trading every single trade. Okay. Now, in any set of analysis. Um, Waka, I believe, mentioned this last week as well. We tend to play devil's advocate to look for hedge positions. Okay, so we tend to. What do I mean by we tend to play devil's advocate? If you're looking for sell opportunities, we tend to look for potential areas that the market could buy as well. So it's just so that you have um, an unbiased opinion of the market after. So you ha you open the market as a blank sheet. You open your chart. You analyze, and you find okay the stronger bias is for a sell. So naturally you're gonna be looking for sell opportunities, but you wanna have a what if scenario. What if the market goes for a buy? Okay, and in a scenario, um, and then you'll have like your POIs marked out where the market could potentially go for a buy. Now, in a case like that, what I personally tend to do again is I'll enter two trades, okay? 
and I need to guarantee myself some kind of profit. Remember, trading. What? Let me ask you guys a question. Why did you guys come into trading? Why did you guys come into trading? Make money, time, freedom. Okay. If you guys said freedom, that's the right answer. If you guys said money, then that's the wrong answer. You already got the wrong mentality. It's gonna uh, am I screw you in the backside one day. Only because um, an increase of greed in the market. But yeah, you come in for time freedom, okay? That's the most important thing in life, time freedom, and to be able to live life on your own accord. But now, do you want to have, do you really call it as time freedom if you're monitoring your phone or your trading view account every single 10 minutes to see what you call it, um, if you're monitoring your account every single day, if you're monitoring, no, not even every single, if you're monitoring your account every five minutes, 10 minutes, oh, where's the market gone? Where's the market gone? Where's the market gone? Is that time freedom? Or if you're enjoying yourself at a family event or whatever, and the back of your head, instead of enjoying yourself in the back of the head, back of your head, the only thought that's going through is, oh shit, what's gonna happen? Is my trade gonna hit a sell? Is my trade gonna go to TP? What's, how, much, how, much, how many pips I'm in profit? It's not time freedom at all. So you need to have criteria where you can secure yourself some form of profit with, and like the thing is as well, like you need to consider the human cycle as well. Like naturally you're gonna be sleep um, some portion of the time. You're gonna be busy some form of the time. Sometimes you're not gonna have enough data to um, open up your MT4, the area that you're in, it's got low connection. So you're not really gonna be able to, able to open up your MT4. And then scenarios, you need to use solid TPs, okay? So when the market does react, you're at least going to guarantee yourself some form of profit no matter what happens. So what I tend to personally do is I'm my first devil's advocate position. Um, I'm my first devil's advocate position. And then depending on how, or what's the risk reward. So this is a big factor. It's more intuition kind of thing. The same, my first devil's advocate position is here where the market could potentially go for buys. And there's a high chance that I won't be monitoring the market at this time here. I'll do two things. I'll set a solid TP here and 10 pips above it, I'll set an alert. So this is my two, two things that I do. I'll set an alert 10 pips above, but also at the price where the market could tend to come for reverse up for buys, I'll set an, what you call it, um, a solid TP. And the reason why is just say this happens at 2 a.m. in the morning, I'm fully conked out, I'm asleep. I don't have a chance to monitor this. The market comes, taps in here, and the buy scenario ends up playing out. I'm going to take an L on this trade. And this all happened overnight, so I'm going to take an L on this trade. But what tends to happen is I'll put, depending on how many, just say if this is a 1 to 10, then I'll put 10% of my volume at this risk here. If this was going to be like something like 1 to 30 or 1 to 40 with a devil's advocate position in, I'll put a bigger position, bigger percentage of my risk down. If it's something like 1 to 30, where I think the first first instances of buys could take place, then I'll put a good 30% of my risk into uh, the second position here with a solid TP. Now, in a scenario where something like this plays out, if I'm awake, then at least I can monitor, my alert will go off and I can quickly have a glance over the market again. And I can be like, okay, is it worth me taking my TP off and letting it swing as a whole volume position? But if in the scenario where I don't see my alert because I'm busy or I've got something going on, if, if a scenario like this plays out, I'm guaranteed the profit from the first trade. At least I'm guaranteed that profit for the first, uh, from my first position. Uh, if this does reverse and I haven't broken even or anything, even if I take it L, my bias has been positive. Where this chart is USDCHF, where what's it called, 30%, if my 30% of my volume was here and this hits one to 30, well, 30 pounds times 30 again, I gain 900 pounds, I gain 9% of the uh, account. Okay, and when this does reverse and hit here, then uh, hit SL, I, instead of losing 100% of my risk, I lose 70% of my risk now. So in a, overall in that trade where uh, it would have been a 0% gain trade because it would have break even, but it would have been a negative 1% trade, I still gained 8.3% from that position. And you need to factor all of these things in when you're trading. It's really key because the thing is, as much as everyone says and glorifies that once you become a trader, you get all that freedom, whatever you want your life to, you don't, you don't want your life to revolve around trading. You want trading to revolve around your life. So you want to be able to live your life how you can and trade when you're free and trade on your own accord. You don't want it to be constantly in your head, whatever. So these are just um, parameters that you can take place, uh, put into place where 
even on the worst case scenario, you're still securing something in your positions. No, what I'm saying is, um, yeah, yeah um, if you put a TP and then it TPs the whole position, but on your MT4 account, you can swipe right on a trade and press the tick button. And if you press the tick button, you can manually close a specific lot size from your position. So in a trade where you have just say 10 lots open, if you want to close 10% of that trade, that's one lot. You can manually close one lot from that trade. Um, it goes with the flow mainly. Uh, with, with this specific style, it goes with the flow. It depends with how, how far away my devil's advocate position is. If it's, if I think, uh, if I'm in a sell trade and my buy scenario is a one to 10 risk to reward away, um, in that scenario, I'll put 10%. Uh, so it'll, it'll be oh, like- yeah. For, uh, for the guy that's asking about the taking partials um, automatically, which is what we do, um, and when you explain the twin trading stuff, uh, that will answer that question. Okay. Um, I think um, it's quite hard to imagine that. Um, so I'll have to, well, I'll try to explain it. Um, on two positions, so that one will close automatically with different TPs. So if you're asleep, open two positions, so that one will close automatically with different TPs. Yeah, yeah. So again, um, the TP of the first one is because uh, natural. I know a lot of people will put the TP here uh, in a scenario like this. Um, this is commonly a place where to put your TP because because now you're in a bearish market. You know what needs to happen is a break of structure needs to happen here. So people will put the TP at the equal lows, uh, equal low, knowing that that low needs to be taken out. But this is what I'm telling you guys, have one position where if the market does go for a buy scenario, um, it does go for a buy scenario, at least you'll still get that profit because it can, and in practice, you'll see this happen so many times. Like it'll, it's not gonna create the equal low, it'll mitigate something here in here, fail to create the equal low and then end up making a new high. So instead of being taken out with a whole percentage percentage loss, you come out with um, some kind of profit. In a, one to, um, in a one to 20 scenario, you'll come out with um, an 8% gain at the end of a trade that if you didn't go through such a route, you would have failed on that trade. Um, super. So if you're going to hit 30% potentially, you have two TPs, one and 10% and 20 and 30%. Uh, that's three TPs. Uh, if I'm going for a one to three, again, it just depends where, how far down uh, the buy size scenario can take place. Okay. Like if this was one to 30 and the buy size scenario was just here and just say I was only going for an intraday position. So for some, um, I was only looking for a TP here, then it'll be worth um, raising it slightly higher, maybe putting like whole good 50% of your risk with the solid TP here at the buy side scenario, because even if the market does play out to your final TP, it's not much more. So it's more, again, it's more intuitively on what's going to happen or um, in the case where your trade fails. No, 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 no. Again, like I said, it depends on the risk to reward of your devil's advocate position. If if you're projecting a one to 100 and the buy side scenario is uh, a one to 10, there's no point taking 50% volume. Just take 10% volume at that point. Yeah. So it's more how much percentage of the trade is at your devil's advocate position. Yeah, it's basically a skill you'll pick up over time. There's no set rule, it just depends on your buys are uncomfortable, you are leaving the trade to run, close whatever. You mean, yeah, PRZ in the opposite direction. So if you're in a sell trade, the potential reversal zone um, on the, what do you call it? Um, what's it called um, for a buy side? Well, is this on lower time frame or high time frame? How does this apply in apply to position trading? Again, like I said, it depends on your, what you call it, um, what your final target is. I think what people are misunderstanding is what devil's advocate really means. What you have to realize is if there's five confluences for the sell, 
that that indicates to you as an analyst that the sell scenario has strength. But when it comes to the markets, it's not lining up confluences and the more confluences you have is better. From the market's perspective, you can have five reasons to sell and only one reason to buy, but that buy reason plays out. So it's not mm-hmm. what we need to do is be intelligent and say, you know, stack up, stack up our reasons to sell. But at the same time, we can appreciate if it goes for a buy scenario, we can still understand why it just was not favorable. So our job as traders is to find the higher probability or more favorable setups. But when there's a scenario, this I do this all the time as well. Um, when I'm looking to sell, for example, I want to see uh, why I'm why I could take a loss. I, w- I want to see what is the buy situation and why it could turn into a bullish uh, market. And if I see a place where I can sell, which is my preference, which is my favorable outcome, but then I also see the non-favorable outcome, which is the buy. But I see that as a you know a good entry. I'll take both, and then that can be a hedging situation. And as well, you're saying you can either do you know normal risk on the sell, normal risk on the buy, or you can leverage floating profit from the sell, which is break even, and leverage that amount into into the devil's advocate position, which is the buy. Yeah. I think um, actually, let, let me let me show this example in GBPCHF, and people will understand what I mean. So. This, uh, Another good example, which is more just a, a theoretical one, not from a, from a chart, but though you will see this because it happens pretty much on a daily basis. You'll be seeing a situation where on a lower time frame, something looks like a distribution and it's in a supply zone. So you'll be looking to sell. But at the same time, it might have a break of structure. We'll explain this later on. But one of the reasons we see a reaccumulation as opposed to a distribution is a break in structure uh, at the midpoint. So we might see a situation where we have a sell scenario and a distribution playing, but it leads to a break in structure. And now you can actually play the devil's advocate situation and say, this could turn into a buy. So in that situation, you can actually take two entries. And then obviously one of them is going to hit stop loss. But you know, because your risk reward is greater than one to one, that you can take a stop loss and then catch the greater move. I'll, I'll, when I jump onto my iPad, I'll explain that better. Um, take a look at this example here. So this is a GBP chef trade down. Um, it's literally from Monday, I believe. Oh, what, what day is that time now? Um, whoever day that is, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, look at this um, sell trade here on GBPCHF. It's it played out to be at the end of it. It played out to be one to forty risk to reward, and before it reversed. But before it also reversed, it took out the structure point here, and the market became bearish. Right? It took out the structure point here. Now, naturally, you'd anticipate the market not to come up into this um, region here or clear this high again because it's bearish, so you'd anticipate sales taking place here. And that's where I took a stop loss here on one of the sales that I had here based on this M15 market structure. Now, if you weren't to take any volume off, if you weren't to take any volume off in your trade, then at one point you are floating 40% of your account and thinking that it's not going to come back into this area here, the market reversed and that's it. Where you are floating 40% of your account, now you're floating zero or minus one, depending on how the depending if you modified your SL or not. So it's just a way to maximize um, the potential profit you can make and save yourself from uh, potential losses in the future. In this scenario here, where I had my solid TP because on M15 it is bullish until that happened, but knowing that we're still in a bullish market structure. I had my TP inside a point of interest here, which is marked up by this um, red box. So uh, that's where um, I analyzed my TP to be set in here. And then obviously I didn't know that the market structure is going to play out and break structure here. Uh, that's not something I could potentially know. Um, you can't predict when the market is going to decide to break structure. You just know once it happens, you know how to react to it. But once it did break structure here, I could have been sitting there wallowing like, oh, why did I take TP here? If now the market is going to bearish and it's going to play out so much more, M15 is going to bearish, that means probably M1 BOS is going to take, uh, H1 BOS is going to take place, so on and so forth. But look what, because I took the TP here, uh, and I took quite a significant volume of my TP here as well, when the when the market broke structure here, I know most people would have been like, oh, I shouldn't have taken TP here, because now it's gone bearish, now it's going to continue going down. Uh, because I took the TP here, when the market did reverse and I took the SL here, I was fine with it because I had enough volume already from this. Uh, I had enough profit already secured from GBPCHF trade uh, that took place a, a day or two earlier. So it's, it's when it comes to in practice, obviously in 
theory, everything seems picture perfect, whatever, so on and so forth. But in practice, you need to adapt these certain things to maximize your potential uh, in positions. Um, yeah, and a uh, reason why the buy setups wasn't used as a what to call a um, potential hedge um, trade here because it didn't give um, you know the lower time frame stuff that we look for in buys. It didn't give any of that um, to go off. So it was just basically um, you go off what you have, and it didn't give us anything to enter a buy. So uh, we couldn't enter a hedge. But naturally, this is the point. The devil's advocate position is also where you would look for your hedge uh, hedge entry. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go over the trade when you start doing the breakdowns. Uh, everyone follows so far? Well, this is significant. Um, this is um, actually um, 1 to 35 by the time it reached here. So I took, uh, personally, in this scenario here, I'd love to take a good 30% of our volume, 40% of our volume. Cool. Yeah, I quickly went over trend trading. I'll go over it again. So the three points that I mentioned about account management, um, I'll quickly run through them again. The first thing I mentioned was in a scenario where, just so that everyone gets everything in their notes, in a scenario where you've taken an entry, um, you haven't had your BOS yet. Um, sorry. Yeah, what's wrong with this? Control Z. Okay. Just say um, your higher time frame POI is um, bearish, whatever. You came into that zone, you took an entry based off your higher time frame. Now, your lower time frame structure is playing out like this. It hasn't become bearish yet. So you haven't had a reason to break even on your trade yet. But because your SL is so tight, you're floating already 1 to 10, 1 to 20 by the time the market's reached um, one of these zones here. Well, what I personally say is take partials off your risk. So if you're, if you've got um, what to call a 100 pound risk on, uh, remove 100 pounds from your floating profit. If you've got a 10 pound risk on, remove 10 pounds from your floating profit. And again, the way you do that on MT4 is you swipe right on the trade that you're in, you press the tick button, it'll display the trade with the lot size, whatever, type in how many lots you want to close and then press confirm and it will close that many lots and you secure partials of your risk. Now, obviously until a BOS takes place, what you call it, the market could still go higher. It could still, what you call it, um, retrace to any other point um, higher or any other IFCs, whatever that's left um, is still valid. So until that BOS, uh, if the market did come and turn around and what you call it, take you out of the trade, then at least you're still BE uh, in terms of how much, uh, how much money your account was sitting on. Yeah, on your on your trading record, it might show up as a loss because you hit SL, but it would have showed up as a loss anyway. But at least you haven't lost any money in that loss. Second thing uh, I mentioned was in a scenario where you got something like this taking place again. You had an uptrend, and now you got your IFC here. You're, you're anticipating something like this, actually. You're anticipating this leg to take place. But inside this area here where your IFC is, you got three, four points of interest, okay? You got, you got multiple points of interest. Just say you got two points of interest. Maybe imbalance fill and uh, then the mitigation of IFC, the open of a true IFC, something like that. So you got two points of interest. If they're close enough to each other, then what I, put, I personally do is, I take one and I take what, two entries with the same SL. So instead of having like an entry like this and an entry like this at the higher uh, point of interest, at the higher points of interest, what I do is um, I take two entries and I have the same SL on the both. The lower entry will cover both my points of interest and the higher entry will obviously only cover the higher points of interest. 25% um, risk on my biggest stop loss trade and 75% risk on my smaller stop loss trade. 
and in a scenario that the trade does play out, I keep 80% of the profit. And because my risk is split between the two positions in the scenario where the trade doesn't play out, I still only lose the same amount of money. I still only lose 1% instead of having a scenario where I do something like this 1% here and 1% here. Um, if the trade doesn't play out, I lost 2%. So I lost double what I would have lost. Uh, but if, if it does gain, then I gain 80% of what I would have gained anyway. So it's a factor of 1.6 overall. Um, what are the questions? Why not take 2% so you never leave? leave profit if it hits us up. What? Why not taking 2% so you never leave without profit if it hits us up? Uh, I'm not understanding that. Um, but yeah, if you're risking, you, um, right now you're in the mindset where you think that your trade is going to play out. You need to consider your trade not playing out as well. Okay, Especially if you guys are new, then you're going to see more of your trades are not going to play out compared to the trades that does play out. Your accuracy ain't going to be that high. So you might take 5 to 10 L's back to back before you get your win. Obviously, as you get better, I, um, your accuracy is going to increase. But you, you, you need to consider the losing scenario. That's how you be risk averse on a trade. Should I give her a shot at explaining? Because I don't think people are catching it still. Yeah, go on. <clears throat> okay. So basically, twin trading is something Wiley taught me, and it's not something I used to do. As you guys have probably seen from my telegram and, and the way I trade, and even now, it hasn't really changed too much. I prefer to hold trades for a long time, uh, and I prefer to be more of a swing trader as opposed to uh, Alex, for example. He's more of an intraday trader, and he will take, you know, something hold it for one or two days and he's showing you how to do that with uh how to master structure uh while on the other hand he's do he does both he does swing and intradays as well but with the with the swing trading kind of thing the whole idea is you want to you have a projection on a daily uh, on a daily view and you can foresee something for example on an accumulation on a daily you can anticipate a break of structure on the daily so you can be holding a trade for weeks if not months and you guys have seen me do that now where i've been holding multiple trades for two, three, four months at a time. And as a result of that, what you want to be doing is you want to be maximizing um, maximizing a reward, obviously. So therefore, if you were to take partials out on a one hour break of structure, but you are anticipating a daily break of structure, when it does reach that daily point and you're down 50% of your volume because you took partials out, for me, in my mind, that was inefficient. It was like, okay, if I'm foreseeing 500 pips, but I take partials at 100 pips, I was inefficient with the remaining 400 pips. And also you have to consider, uh, this is another topic, but you have to consider as well, if you're 400 pips up and you foresee another 100 pips, you have to realize what do I do to manage that remaining 100 pips with anticipation that it could all, all reverse. So taking profits has to be a calculated decision too. So when I was just operating in that way, for me, there were so many situations where I would be holding a trade for one or two weeks. It would go up in profit one to 15, one to 20, and then it would reverse on me and it would hit break even. In my head, that was completely fine because um, no, I don't really use trading stops stops that often. I, I like to have a bit more control. But you know, when when price reverses and comes back to break even, from my point of view, that's fine because I didn't take a loss and I can always enter on another position and catch that daily move I was looking for or catch that full swing potential I was hoping for. So that was my uh, mindset coming into it. Now, when I met Wally, and uh, I was discussing this with him. And he was like, no, you have to try this, this twin trading system out. And for me, that seemed very counterintuitive. So basically what the twin, tra twin trading system is, regardless of if you have a 1 to 100 in mind or a 1 to 50 in mind or a 1 to 10 in mind, it doesn't matter, if, it doesn't matter what your target is. You have to make a rule for yourself. And this is what it was initially. It's changed now. But initially what it was, was you enter two positions. You say, for example, if your total risk is 1% for a trade, you will enter two positions manually, both with 0.5% risk. So combined together at the same entry points with the same stop loss, you have two positions, both of 0.5% risk. So therefore, as a, uh, as a total, you have 1% risk with equal entry uh, price and equal stop loss price. Now, what you have to do is with one of the entries of 0.5% risk, you set a fixed TP. And that fixed T, T, uh, TP 
Um, so when price reaches that, automatically takes the profit, uh, usually at one to three risk reward. Now that's irrespective of what structure is saying, that's irrespective of um, what other technical analysis would be showing you. It's kind of a rule written in stone that every entry, every trade you take, 50% of your volume, so 0.5%, has to um, automatically close at one to three risk reward. Now in my, in my mind, when he was telling me that, I was like, yeah, but say for example, I'm holding a trade for, for two months and I took half of my volume off on the first day because it hit, to, hit one to three risk reward on the first day. And then for the remaining two weeks, I was running on half volume. That seemed very inefficient. So we were comparing our accounts and he was showing me like he, he um, one of his smaller accounts, or well, still a significant size account, but one of his slower, smaller accounts, he, he hooked up to my FX book and he was showing me the, the data of that. And he was like, yeah, but he, he was breaking it down to me to try and justify it for me because it, didn't make, it seemed very counterintuitive. He was saying, basically using the twin trading methodology, he was doubling his accounts. Uh, I don't know what was it monthly, Wally? As uh, like every two weeks. Um, actually, it's it's in our it's one of our, it's in one of our chats. Um, the screenshot from the yeah, yeah, I remember. Okay, so let's let's say one every once every three weeks, you were um hundred percent return with two percent risk. Now that that seemed kind of crazy, and I, and I was like, oh, so you've been hitting big swing trades, and he was like, no, no. So basically, the twin trading system, what it does is, um it maximizes your portfolio, but it doesn't maximize the trade. I think, I think write that down because that's going to take a few minutes to digest. It maximizes your efficiency in your portfolio, but it doesn't maximize the efficiency in the individual trade. Now, what do I mean by that? Because there has been so many occasions where I've, you know, taken entry with a four pip stop loss and hit one to 10 in the same day. And then it's gone on to hit break even or reversed or whatever the case may be. So with my traditional way of trading, I'm going to not take any partials because it's just 40 pips or whatever. Um, and then at that point, I, you know, it's hit, it's hit break even. So I'm not concerned, but that was inefficient as well. While he was saying that the fact that you're hitting break even on a one to 10, that's opportunity cost. You've not maximized on 10%. You could have closed. And in, in my mindset, it was fine because it wasn't a loss, but as a portfolio, that is inefficient trading as well. So taking volume off on a swing trade is inefficient, but also not taking partials on a trade that hits break, hits break even is also inefficient. So you kind of have two opposing views where both of them show inefficiency. So to found, find the, um, to, to eliminate some sort of discrepancy and actually have something that appeases both sides because you, you can't just pick one because then you're having great inefficiency. That's where the twin trading model comes in. So if I hit a one to 10 and it goes on to reverse, at least I captured uh, on the 0.5% uh, that I entered on the twin trading system. Now, if it's gone for one to 10, I capture 5% and the remaining 5% potential hits break even. So at least at the end of that trade, I'm not up 0%, I'm up 5%. And say, for example, in a week, you hit, uh, you take 10 trades. Out of those 10 trades, three or four hit stop loss. So you're down um, 4%. Now, the remaining three or four trades, they hit break even. And that's very common as well. You're going to hit a lot of break-even trades. Now, instead of having 0% on those, now you're up, say if it's one to three, you're, uh, you're up 1.5% on each position, 1.5 times three or four break-evens. You're looking at 5% positive from something that would normally give you nothing. And now for the remaining one or two trades that go on to hit your swing potential, that go on to hit that big one to 20, one to 50 or whatever. Okay, you didn't maximize upon, upon them, but how often are you catching those trades? Those trades are, you know, less often. You're going to catch a big trade like that once every month, once every two weeks or whatever. But in the meantime, you're maximizing. One thing probably worth mentioning here, in terms of like one to 100 risk to reward, between the three of us, we probably only have had 20 of one to 100 plus risk to reward. But how many trades have you analyzed with one to 100 potential? Hundreds. Yeah, that's the but thing. You don't know if it's going to achieve that target in the end. So you need yeah. to actually take... 1 to 30, 1 to 40, and then they turn around and hit break even. So if you never took potential profits whilst you were floating 30% of your account on the trade, then to me, that's a big deal. Yeah. Also, also, just one quick thing. Do I think about, even though you guys, maybe some people are trading like smaller accounts, think about in the bigger picture. If you're trading a million dollar account or 500,000, whatever is the number, okay, Think about if you're partially out and you're making, let's say, 5% break even, 5% break even, but you end up doing like, let's say, your week ends up doing like a 2% up because you take losses, you took break evens, those break even with partials. You are 2 3% up for the week, 
even though it was not a great week, 2% up of a million dollar account or a 500,000 or whatever, is still a lot of money or is it still a good amount of money? So also think about in that sense of managing like big portfolios and not thinking about like 1K account, 2K account, 3K account in the bigger picture. Example, I sent it to implement. someone that just asked, how do you know when to close the trade manually? The whole idea is uh, if you're twin trading, half your volume is automatically closed at one to three. Now, obviously what, what me, Wally and Alex do is we will make separate accounts at times for something we see a great swing potential in. And sometimes we will manage it a little bit differently. And now actually, because our stop losses are lower than what they used to be. Um, now our twin trading criteria is at one to five instead of one to three. But the point is half of your volume automatically closes and the remaining 50% of your volume in the trade, you manually close. For example, you can close partials at a significant break of structure where you see price, price reversal can happen, or you wait a little bit, see if there are signs of reversal, then you take partials. Um, and then the, the remaining you leave for your swing potential. But what you have to realize as well, of course, what we're showing on our telegrams and our Instagram, et cetera, is the big trades, the, the impressive one to 100s or one to 50s or whatever. But those trades are not the ones that give the most significant account growth. Of course, as one trade, it's very impactful and it's very impressive, but that's not what's consistently growing our accounts. What's consistently growing your accounts will be those you know, weekly one to 10 risk reward trades. Um, of course, it's nice to have a big trade, a big swing trade running because that accumulates profit without you having to do anything as Wiley was mentioning about freedom. But what is actually going to co compound your account better is twin trading with a one to 10 risk reward system, as opposed to hoping to catch a one to 50. Let's see what's happening in the chat box. Yeah, also someone asked uh, if you always close one to three, uh, like 50% of the volume one to three, uh, I think you already answered that question, no. And something that as Waka said right now, something in that case we'll do right now, uh, as we enter in M1, instead of partialing out in one to three, that was a lot more like, let's say eight months ago or a long time ago. Now what we do is maybe partial out in one to tens, depending on the setup, of course. Someone asked like uh, about how many accounts you have, et cetera. It, it depends. For, for example, me, I have two accounts. One is my main, uh, main account, and then I have a smaller account as well. And I'll trade them a little bit differently. And now we also have a, a joint account, which we're trading as a three, um, just to see how we perform together and, uh, you know, interacting with each other so that we can, you know, have a c accurate model for when we open up the fund in a couple of months. Um, Alex, on the other hand, I think he only has one or two accounts personal. But Wally, on the other hand, I think he has over 20 accounts or something crazy like that. It does depend. Um, the reason why I have so many accounts is um, normally every time I take a big swing trade. Um, so obviously I have my main account where, what do you call it? Um, I take my highest potential um, pos uh, possible trades, but I have um, other accounts where, for example, if I see like a two, three month trade, I don't want to be logging into my account and being able to see it every single day. So I'll fund that account with a specific amount. I'll leverage the whole account into the trade. If it doesn't work, I'll blow the account. But in terms of how much my um, overall trading account net worth is, is within risk management. But that accounts, the whole accounts leverage into the trade. If it plays out, it plays out. I get significant growth. If it doesn't, then the account gets blown. But it's still within risk management of all of my accounts. Um, and also, um, I like to experiment a lot with different theories. Um, what I like to know, I come up with something quite random quite often. So when I'm experimenting something, I have smaller accounts where I um, check them out. But I also have an account under all of my siblings' names. So once they come of age and stuff, then um, that account, I'm growing consistently with smaller trades, all of them accounts. I've got one under each person's name. So once they're like 18 or once they're ready to buy a house or something like that, then um, they can do that. But um, there was one thing um, I was reading. Um, actually, let me, let me find this. Wally, what, what I was asked saying is if you take a trade of 100 as 1% hmm, and you are running at 10%, instead of taking partials of 100, so if it goes into SL, you leave at BE, you've you take 200, so always leave at 1% if it goes to SL. I, I'm not understanding um, the question, bro. I thought I understood it when I read it the first time, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure what you're trying to ask. 
what I was trying to say is, um, just say you took a trade uh, with 100 pound risk, the account is one to, the, the trade is one to 10 now, you're floating a thousand pounds, but in terms of analysis, you're not at a point where you should break even yet, the market could still return to your entry, then whilst you're floating a thousand pounds, take off 100 pounds as partials. So you risk 100 pounds, you remove partials of 100 pounds, and once the trade returns to your entry, if it does, or if it hits your SL, um, what do you call it? Um, yeah, you might, what do you call it? Um, lose 100 pounds, but you lost the 100 pounds you gained. So your overall gain and loss on that account is 0%. But in the scenario where it comes back to your entry and creates equal highs or something like that, and before it moves or it like, because it happens a lot as well, where the market will come back to your entry one, two, three times before it actually does drop. And that scenario, scenario you didn't, um, get taken out of the trade because you be too early. Is there more info on this in Discord? Uh, I'll, I'll put up a PDF on Discord for you guys. What do you use to connect all the accounts to take trades? I don't, um, okay, this, this is um, more of a, what do you call it, a personal thing. I don't, I don't take the same trade on every single account. Um, I'll have different kinds of trades that I'll take on different kinds of account, but that's like a personal criteria that I have. You were to the very end, basically saying, I want to turn 2% up. So if... Yeah, you can do that. Um, you, you can definitely do that. But the reason why I take um, only my risk off because I'm not, a, I'm not a position where I should be taking any TP or anything anyway. So obviously it's just to maximize the potential of the swing if the swing does play out. A few accounts and fix energy to manage them all, but only one trade from one account. Really, see. when you put SL on B, when you take when you take that TP one, yeah, naturally when you hit something like TP one and you've got a significant break of structure or something like that, you can bring the stop loss. Once your analysis says the market shouldn't return to your entry, that's when you put your trade in B. So as long as according to your analysis the market could still return to your entry, you shouldn't be breaking even on that trade. But once you're 100% sure that the market is not going to return to your entry, you can look to break even. Can't wait to lie here for that. Is it not safe to put a trade in B? And if it hits, you can re enter. No, because you don't know when the market is going to come back to your um, BE point. If it's going to come back to your BE point whilst you're doing something, you're not going to be able to see it. Um, you might well, not. Yeah, I think we're getting too into too many specifics, and we can save that for the actual sessions. But the key takeaway things is. You just got to, uh, basically, these are little tricks and they're not that difficult to do, but they have reasonings behind them. And if you start applying these tricks, test them out for yourselves, see if it has any difference in your own trading. But for example, the whole thing about him saying you can break even without moving your stop loss by taking a partial out. That is very important because as you guys know about the banker block or the momentum trend line, just because your entry has happened and you might have a good entry, price can always return back to your entry point, mitigate something and then continue down. And that would be a valid situation. But if you broke even, you're out of the trade just because uh, you broke even too early. So if you have a, a an entry in a place where, you know, that you still foresee price can return to, what you can either do is reduce your stop loss. So now instead of your stop loss being 10 pips, is down to five pips just to cover that banker block situation. You can do that. Or another situation that you can do is leave your stop loss and take a partial out. So even if it goes on to hit your stop loss, Overall, you're break even because you didn't lose money because of your partials you've taken. That's one trick you can do. Another trick that he was mentioning was the whole trading system, twin trading system, sorry, that maximizes your portfolio because now your account is constantly ticking over with those small 5%, 4% trades because you're doing that twin trading. Um, and that obviously helps with when you take a loss. Say, for example, if I hit a trade that is break even, but I took a partial out of it with the twin trading, my next loss is paid for. So if, I, if my next trade is a loss, it doesn't matter. Now that gives you a lot of breathing room. And then when you go on to hit a one to 10 officially, now you, can, now you have that breathing room in your mind of, okay, I can lose nine trades in a row and still be okay. So the twin trading system obviously keeps your account ticking over better, but it also frees up a lot of mental stress that you'll be um, chasing off greed or um, different factors like that. Um, and what else was, was from this module, Wiley? There's one thing here. If you take TP at... Uh... 50% at 1 to 10 hour, within the first point be invalidated 10% of 1 to 10 or can we just adopt either one? No, we're talking about two different scenarios here. What I'm saying, taking off 10% um, volume at like 1 to 10 to manage your break-even point. You see, your TPs be at 
in a cell scenario where we say you take like 50% volume, whatever, your TP up are uh, potential buy scenarios. So you might not have reached your buy scenario, but you're floating significant amount in your account to take profit. Like th this is what we're trying to say. Where, where you're taking sub five pip SLs, the market doesn't need to move a significant amount for you to be in significant profit. Your buy scenario might be 100 pips away. You got a five pip SL, your buy scenario is 100 pips away. So your buy scenario is at one to 20 risk to reward. And that's where you'll have your, what do you call it? You know, when you said your twin trade, one position with a solid TP. Um, do you see when we're talking about one to three, one to five solid TPs, that's before we even had the refined IFC. So when once we met, when me, Waka, Alex, when we first met, we weren't taking sub five pip SLs. We were still using um, H4, H1, um, OBs and stuff like, um, IFCs and stuff like that, where we were trading, uh, our trading hasn't come to a point where we could take such small SLs. That's why we use one to three, one to five. But now, because our cells are so much smaller, when like your buy side, your when you're twin trading, the solid TP is at where your buy side entry could be. That's where your solid TP is for one of your trades. But that could be a hundred pips away. Now, once you're 50 pips in profit with a five pip SL, you're still one to ten. Um, but you still haven't had that significant structure point or anything taken out, and the market could still return to your entry. That's where you. That's the scenario where, where you would remove ten percent of your volume. Well, uh, let's, I've seen a lot of people requesting a break, so let's do a. Because last week we didn't do a lunch break um, because we got carried away. So let's let's have a proper lunch break today, um, and then I'll take over. Us, and we're just going to run through a lot of examples now. Um, of different trades that are different um, different models. For example, a trade based on accumulation, a trade based on distribution, a trade based on just intraday, different situations so you can kind of get a feel for everything. And we'll be doing top down from monthly all the way down to the one minute. We have a bunch of examples for them. So what we can do is at, let's do a 30 minute break, 25 past the hour. So 25 past six uh, UK time. We'll come back. My legs are dead.